Welcome to Bite Size Dental Marketing. Today I have Melinda Hayford. Melinda, I am such a big fan of your company. I learned about you guys through Jessica. And, you know, of, of course, we're both friends with Susan Lekowitz, who, who does phenomenal work. Susan and I met actually with Jessica on a man named Jim Heller, Dr. Heller up in Boston. And it was such a rewarding experience because, you know, we, we would literally surrounded him in the monthly meeting with, with the entire suite, you know, C-suite. And I loved it. And, and so I'm, I'm so glad that it led me to you. But with practice management consulting, I, I know that you're really looking at the practice holistically from the front desk to the, to the, the, the team and the culture side. I'd love to hear how you got started in dentistry. Yeah, I, um, my eighth grade teacher was also a counselor. I'm from a really teeny tiny town. So she, she was our high school counselor, our, you know, she was, she was an all around uh, gal. Um, and she, I said, so she was like, what do you want to be when you grow up? I'm like, I have no idea. She said, why don't you be a dental hygienist? And so really it was that conversation that led me to, to work for my general dentist when I was 14 up through high school and work for my orthodontist. And uh, it's easy in, in a teeny town, Eric, as you probably know, to figure out how to make all that work for yourself. And so I started at 14 and I had some incredible training. Uh, the, the wife of the dentist that I work for, she was kind of a driver. And she wanted to teach us the right way. So she taught me the right way. And, and I was a rover. I started, that was my first position. I was a rover. Now, of course, we don't call them rovers anymore because, you know, it's not like <laughs> politically correct. But I was a rover. And then I went to work for a big group group practice. And in that group practice, I really saw that I couldn't be a hygienist because of my personality style. I you know, like a lot of things. And I like diversity. And so I just could see watching the hygienist that that was not the perfect fit for me. Um, but I, I grew up in a family uh, business. So I love the business side. And so I always leaned towards that business side. And, you know, in a group practice, it's easy to get a lot of different experience. I started clinically and then I worked at the front desk and then I managed. And so that was a beautiful um, experience for me to like get this great um, breadth of knowledge to figure out, well, what do I really want to do? So when I was 22, I went to work for a management consulting company and I had no idea what I was doing. No idea. Yeah. <laughs> you know? I knew dentistry and, you know, and I just, I had a really great trainer and she was beautiful, Dorothy Carvajal. She took me under her wing and, um, and I learned how to do consulting, you know, from that perspective. Mm. It was, it was cool. Now you mentioned your personality on the pre-show. We were talking about disc and strength finders. I love how those get rolled out. And I will tell you, I, I know it's talked a lot about a lot in dentistry. And across all the interviews I've done, Brent Cornelius, Dr. Cornelius out of Keller, Texas, he did bring up one time that when a new patient calls, he matches the tone, how they ask their questions with which hygienist he gives them. He, he's trained the front desk. Beautiful. And I thought that was so cool. That's I never beautiful. thought of it. Beautiful. I have two questions wrapped into one here, but how how do you use DISC today or other personality traits in your consulting? Because it's, it's such a fascinating element and, and how do you ensure they're used, right? And the second question is, what is the biggest challenge you're facing today as you step into these offices? Yeah, that's great. So let me do the first one first. Um, I've used this for many, many years. And, you know, I, I even taught my two daughters, like, how do you, how do you identify a personality? And what I love about DISC is uh, it's behavior. It matches, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a behavioral tool. It's not an instinct tool and it's not an IQ tool. It's a behavioral tool. So you can, if you watch people, you can easily see what they're presenting. Are they reserved? Are they outward? Are they warm? Are they kind of standoffish? And, you know, as human beings, we love to be mirrored. And so mm -hmm. the... That's what I love about DISC is when you understand the tool, just like your dentist did, he was brilliant because you can tell by pace of tone and the tone, what, you know, if you match that, if you teach your front desk to match that, wow, the patient automatically goes from, 
I'm calling a brand new office to these people get me. Oh my gosh, mm -hmm. these people mm -hmm. get me. And so that's what I love about the tool. So I love it and in how we can apply it and easily teach it to team members so that they can use it with patients and also how we can they can use it with team members because you know as you as you know the inner strife on a team is a lot more has a lot more weight than mm -hmm. the patient management you know it's it's easy to be kind to a patient for an hour that's all we have to be sure. with that recare but we have to be with these people we work with day in and day out and so teaching how to actually understand differences which is what that tool is about the tool is like understand yourself but also understand hmm. differences and it's good you know how it's like I only like the people who are like me. Well, that that's like very small minded. And if we can like sure. all styles and see what's good about all styles, then we're, then it's beautiful because now we have some flexibility and we have some ability to actually take those people that we work with and have a better relationship. So I, I love this for that reason. I mean, I use a bunch mm. of different tools, Eric. And so that's one of the tools and I love how easy it is to teach people that tool. Yeah. Now, we were talking about strength finders. Do you know your top five? Yeah, let's see if I have them memorized. I have one that's like yours. I think Activator is my number one, too. Mm -hmm. And I have uh, Relator and Woo, I think, is one of mine. I have one in Strategic. I have two in Relationship. And I have two in Influence. I have some of each, which is helpful. You know, I have some friends that have all Strategic, right? That's cool, too. I mean, yeah, it's cool, yeah. too, right? Uh, it's, it, I think it just is so helpful to know what our, you know, what we might be really good at. Like, in my team, I have opposite of me. And it is really useful because they are, they great, they're great at following through. They cross every T and dot every I. That's beautiful because that's not me, right? I'm much <laughs> more big picture and move a thousand miles a minute. And, you know, and with all of that, we have a team, as you know. Yeah, I, I believe strongly in the, you need to marry your weaknesses, not your strengths. And, and, and your team needs to compliment you you know, versus all of us be the same. Yeah. Now, 2023 has been an interesting year. You know, we're, I will say from marketing standpoint, this is the first year that we've seen getting back to some normal seasonality. Yeah. I think a lot of that's, you know, primarily because more people are going back into the office. It's, it's set more of a schedule. You know, we had the, the busier August followed by the slower Septembers. And when you're going into your offices, what are the problems that you're seeing today and, and yeah. how are you fixing them? Yeah, I think uh, staff shortage is still real. And um, and I think also onboarding new team members, there's a lack of ability on, on onboarding new team members. I think so there's this tendency to throw them in and mm. hope for the best. You know, they have oh, we hear it on the phones. Yeah, I bet you do. I mean, <laughs> that's you, where you, they throw them. No they, one wants to answer the phones. They throw them, and which is like, imagine. I mean, I mean, it's that probably seems ludicrous to you because all this <laughs> investment is going towards marketing, and so yeah, so so you see it firsthand. It's like throw people in and hope for the best. And the other thing that I see is there's because of that philosophy, it really doesn't make for a great culture. It really makes for kind of a transactional culture. Mm. And and then then you're shifting at those offices are shifting out of team members as fast as they're getting them. So, you know, this year, I, year before last, I saw a very high turnover. This year, it looks better to me from a turnover. Now we're working more on culture and getting that placed in. And then really what how do we how do we get this training thing handled and how do we actually have people know what's expected and help them help them with the tool set so that they can really deliver on what's expected. 
Um, Because I think people want to do well, you know, but when we just throw them in there, it's pretty hard to do well. And then they just do what whatever they've been trained to do. You hear it on the phones, you know, hello, and what's your insurance? I mean, that's the new patient call. It's crazy. It's crazy. So there's, you know, it's like, well, let's back that up and let's go for really who is this patient and what's special about them and let how do we connect with them and how do we make it be we're going for a lifetime relationship or a long-term relationship we're not going for just scheduling that appointment because that's a whole different perspective you know so how do we train them that we're really going for a lifetime or a long-term connection what does that look like when i first interact with someone how would that be different you know so that really i think that's those are some of the questions, you know. Um, so, you know, I do operations. So I'm really uh, looking at all those crucial conversations that team members have. I told my team the other day, we, we did a master class. And so I could just hear those like that, you know, what's your insurance? Uh, you know, you need to come in because it's our policy. And, it, you know, we require a 48-hour notice, so you better come in. And really, you know, just this backing up all those crucial conversations and really having it be a more patient centric, like why should they Mm -hmm. come in? Why should they want to, you know, what's in it for them? Yeah. We have a hundred dollar cancellation policy. Like, why are you telling me that you're already assuming negative, right? That's it. Um, No, I think I have heard near a hundred philosophies on phone answering. Yeah. I bet you have. (laughs) I will tell you, I believe there. And well, I believe all of them can work for me. If I have a front desk who slows down, I think of the three point, just, just slow down. Don't, don't be rushed. Don't try to multitask. Number two, be interested yeah. in the patient. Like, yeah. why, why are you asking me about insurance? Why are you, gosh, why do you think you need a crown already? Why, you know, just, just be interested. It can be anything. I think just ask for the appointment. Just be interested slow down and ask them for an appointment would you would out punch 90% of the other front desk calls isn't that, that I hear. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? When, when you're saying that, Eric, I just think about the 20%, the 20% that makes the 80% difference. It's like simplify the whole thing, which is really what you guys have. Um, you know, it's like, that's why you're saying that because you've listened to thousands of calls and you see, okay, well, if you just did these four things, man, amazing what your conversion would be. Amazing. It does come down to that. And then I think what what I hear is who has time to train, who has time to hold people accountable, who has, who has, we're overwhelmed. Like we don't have time to do all that. Reality is what is the resource that will help your people be their best. Yeah. I love Dennis. They're the salt of the earth. And I very few I've met that I didn't like most of the, the vast majority I've really enjoyed working with, but they do have the challenges that any small business owner has. And it's like, why don't they care as much as I care? And why don't they, yeah. why doesn't my team just know what I want? And yeah. it's like, well, you know, we had, we had this uh, event of uh, one of the dentists sent their team to some CE. And he, he didn't feel like they paid attention. He didn't feel like they were interested. I was like, well, in, in fairness, you're sending them to this course so you can make more money. They're not getting more money. In fact, more patients just mean more work for them. You, you do have to kind of view it through their lens and, and find a way to reach them and motivate them, not just with money, not just, with, you know, there needs to be sort of a culture and a purpose. And yeah. 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 I was um, I was listening to an audio uh, audio podcast by Arthur Miller, and he is uh, studied happiness happiness, and he says three things go into happiness: it's enjoyment, joy, uh, satisfaction, and purpose. And so when I think about team members, I think about okay, well, what will make them joyful? What will make them love their job? What will make them feel a sense of satisfaction. And so you're on to something there, Eric, because I I don't think owners naturally think that. I think they think I'm paying someone to do this job. I'm paying for them to go to the CE. They should naturally dive in like an owner. 
And of course, we hope right. for that owner mentality, but it's very rare. It's very rare. Very. So, you know, uh, we have worked a lot with creating leaders and champions in the practice. And and you see this, there are natural uh, natural people that, that want to lead and do a good job at it. There are natural people that take on like the new patient call or they take on uh, supplies or they take on different things and can be champions. And when we have a, a person to champion some of these areas of the practice, we can have more traction because that person can be kind of the lead, you know, hold the flag up every day yeah. and listen to the conversations and cheer the team on, but really boots on the ground, making the difference in the practice. Because as you have a unique position and so do I, we both have this unique position where we're experts, but we're not there with them. So right. we need, we need, some boots on the ground saying, Hey, what about this? Or what about that? Or Hey, hey what about, you know, like helping implement these, these best practices basically. And so that's mm -hmm. part of what we've really been focused on is how do we get these leaders, you know, staffed up and trained up so that they can, they can have some meaningful conversations to increase joy, satisfaction, and purpose with each of these team members. Now, when you look at your typical engagements, how are you structuring them to make sure that you have that right in office time, the right touch points, the yeah. talk me through your ideal yeah. engagement, if you will. Yeah. The first thing we do is we do a, like a, an analysis or audit. And when mm -hmm. we do that audit, we're really looking at where are all the hidden potentials. I'm sure you have something comparable from a marketing point of view. We do it from an, an operations point of view. Where are the hidden gems in the practice? And who are your people? And so we have a big survey that we have people fill out. And then we actually interview the team members. And that's really, Eric, where we look at DISC and strength finders and some of those things like, who are these people and what is their unique brilliance? Because we're, it's like any team, who do you have mm -hmm. there? And then how do you put them in their best light so that they can be the best at their job? And so we do that analysis and then we really, um, you know, we have best practices. We have, we, you know, we took it from 44 systems to eight, right? <laughs> because, nice. Simplify yeah. it. Yeah. yeah. Let's make this better and easier because 20% leads to eight, 20% of what we do leads to 80% of the result. So true for all, of, for all that we do. And so once we see the hidden potential in the practice and we see who's on the board, who's our team, then we go, okay, how do we, what's the best way to tap into some of this hidden potential and the hidden potential in the team also. And so we do a combination of on-site and then remote learning. Mm -hmm. That's why I have a, a team of trainers. And so I typically do the on-sites and like kind of fire up the team for some front office, back office, mm -hmm. whole team systems. And then it really is about helping each team member figure out how do they shift into that new role. And I think equally important is we're keeping our eyes out for who is the office manager. Do they have all the leadership skills that they need? Dentists don't have time. They are in the mouth. If they're, you know, if they're successful mm -hmm. and they're still practicing, they're focused on dentistry. They're quarterbacking, right? They don't have time yeah. to call these plays. Uh, so that's why we like we like an office manager that is trained to be a leader. We love to have leaders in each department. And then we have a whole group of champions that we identify to, to help champion some of these causes. So you can see we're like looking at creating a voice in the practice and some help for they can help us understand what else that person, that team member may need. They can help us understand where the bottlenecks are. They can help us do all that so that we support them in making this step happen in the practice. Hmm. So that's been the most successful model for us. I mean, I used to just do on sites. I'd leave and then I just tell, you know, I'd leave them an action plan, but you know, right. what I found when I came back. 
you know. Sure. Uh, sitting there on the, uh, oh, oh, sitting that's probably right. in the same place you left it. Well, that's right. We were mm-hmm. supposed to do that. Oh, that's right. So, and now we have dashboards and we have, every team member has a KPI. We create a game plan with um, every office. Now we have an annual event, Eric, where our clients come together. They create their individual plan for the year, their vision. We call it a wig, wildly important goal. They create mm. that for the practice. We have the office managers also. After lunch, we have the doctors announce what their wig is, and then they get to put their heads together with the help of other teams and uh, our trainers, put together a game plan so that that's really what they're executing on for the year. So Hmm. you know the importance of that. It's like you have a plan, and now you're going for that. Now, what did their what do their you know important goals while Wix tend to be? Is yeah. it is it financial growth? Is it yeah? What do they tend uh, to be? There, so I'll give you just some examples. So some were they wanted their hourly doctor production to increase from here to here. So when we say wig, it's from X to Y, right? It's you know there's like you go from here to here because it needs to be measurable. So it's uh, it could be treatment acceptance going from 60 to 75%. It could be hygiene hourly going up. It could be a new patient number going from here to here. So typically it's one of those measurements. And then we like to have it be holistic. So it's not just like we're here for the numbers because that is just gross sure. and nobody likes that. So we really have to extract it into um, getting to yes with our patients and how many did we get yes to yes with and what are the elements of getting to yes and what you know starts on the phone. And um, so we back it into the humanity of growth. Because growth alone is interesting to the doctors, but not very interesting to the or satisfying to the team. So we have to we have to figure out how do we how do we bring that up in a way that's meaningful and makes a difference. Because ultimately, at the end of the day, we as dental professionals, what makes us feel good is when our patients are healthy and they have a beautiful smile if that's what they wanted. Right? It's like healthy patients and in good shape. Yay. Right. And if we can redo their smile because they want us to redo their smile, beautiful. Uh, it, it's so rare to have a career where we can make such a change in a person's yeah. life. It's cool. So that is built into our purpose. And I I think we leverage that because that's what makes us all feel better. It makes you feel better. You know, the more new patients we see, if we do a good job, you have to feel better about that, right? Because you mean more people are getting taken care of. And- no, it's it's true. I'm I've begun to share I the story that I'm about to tell you a, a few times. But yeah, I was a victim of challenging and bad dentistry. Um, I grew up in rural Oklahoma, where the you know I was raised on Copenhagen, Coca Cola, and wrestling, which you know none of those are particularly good for your teeth. And uh, I didn't go to the dentist until I was 28 years old. Yeah. Maybe 27. Uh-huh. And I went and I, I maintain, I, I think the dentist was trying to be funny, you know, but he said, oh gosh, I've seen better teeth on a 60 year old and oh, oof, it hurt. It's done. Cool. Yeah. And, and I actually, you know, I got my problem fixed and I, I don't think I went back until, you know, 32 or so. So, I mean, it really was a while. So and, you, you know, at the time, my mother was going through cancer a treatment and she had all the, uh, also from rural Oklahoma, uh, she had all the challenges of someone, you know, who uh, going through, you know, oncology has, and she befriended this wonderful dentist, uh, John Barroso. And he would really take care of her in a way that was just above and beyond. And at some point he called me and explained to me the problems he was having in dentistry at the time and the challenges. And he knew I was in marketing and I, I happened to be at the practice too. And, the company was actually born out of helping him simplify his life and improve his quality of life. And, and, you know, it led to getting into the team, but we've, I very much believe that you show me someone who's here for the money and I'll show you someone who's here for a short time. Yeah. But I want people who are passionate about dentistry. I want, I think that money is just simply not of enough to long-term motivate you. 
it is. And if you can find the staff, the hygienist who's passionate about oral care, if you can find the the office that you know knows the value of a great smile, I think that's such a impactful thing. And I think it's beautiful that you guys try to find them in there and and put them in positions to succeed. I, I think that's a very rare a very rare event. Typically, we just say, okay, this is the person in the role, you know, and then we sort of beat them into submission yeah. and then wonder why they're not happy. Yeah, which doesn't, is not a very good long-term plan. I mean, and I love, I love, Eric, that your entry into dentistry, like, I love that it came full circle for you and that you met John and that he took care of your mom, because truly that is what we get to do every day with every patient if we, if we choose to. You know, because it's there for every yep. patient. And, you know, I, it's, a, it sounds so corny, but it's really the more we love on patients and our team, the more we love on them. And, and I don't mean love with no expectation for sure. Right. I mean, really mm-hmm, love mm-hmm. on them, like figure out how to have them be healthy, figure out how to help them navigate, you know, like John did with you and your mom. It's, be- it's beautiful. And how rewarding, you know, that, I mean, that's, that's no, why. It- that's why I love dentistry. Yeah, I, I get to be in the position of not only, you know, the first ads I wrote were ads that I thought I would click on. Yeah. So, you know, I use my own journey. But not only do I get to acquire the patients, you know, who may have been like me, but I, gosh, John Broso sold his practice to Dr. Heather Majors, who's now my personal dentist and, and friend. And I think the world of her, but I've got to not only make sure that help John retire well, yeah. And, but I also get to drive patients that I, I think probably walked my journey. Yeah, so beautiful. yeah, my why is, is, uh, is, hey. is pretty rewarding. Yeah. It's mm-hmm. beautiful. It's beautiful. I'm, I'm going to pivot around here. What do you like to see from a dentist? Like, like when you look at your, if you, you take a back, look, step back and think of, you know, your top five or 10 most successful yeah. clients through your career, what did the dentist have in common? Yeah, it's such a great question because I actually think you can cultivate this. I mean, some with style. I had a lot of D dentists, D driver dentists, mm. and they do really well because they get, when they get clear about what they want, they they make they move mountains. And so, but they were all these. I mean, I I think clarity of where they wanted to head. So I mm. early on got to be the management consultant advisor for a Seattle study club lo- locally for me. And I got to hang out with all those general dentists, along with some specialists, and talk about comprehensive care, which I love. I mean, I started as a dental assistant, so it's cool to see all that we can do. You know, it's, I, I work for a periodontist. That was one of the first things I did. And, you know, healing periodontal disease and like opening it a flap up and then taking all the decay out and like restoring that bone. It's amazing. It's amazing. It's beautiful, (laughs) right? It's beautiful. And so, um, so that's what I got to do with, with all those general dentists sitting and talking about all the cases that they, you know, they were wanting to restore, wanting to help the patients restore. And so I, you know, I think an interest in continuing education is one of the things. I think clarity about where you want to head. You don't have to know where you want to head in 10 years, but like next year, what, like the clarity of your vision, the clarity of your focus of goals, so helps the team. So then, and then communicating that. And then I think as best as possible, being a good leader. So we talk, we've talked about this being direct in your communication. So that's one of the things that dentists really struggle with mm-hmm. is that their conflict can be conflict avoided. And so the dentists that were most successful figure out how to be honest, give feedback, uh, help people grow, you know, because that's what you're really doing when you give them feedback is you're helping them grow. And so I, I'd say it really is that, you know, being an awesome dentist, being clear, and then uh, uh, and then developing your team. And part of developing your team is yeah. by having really honest conversations with them, you know, and mm. lifting them up. Yeah. We do a book club here with our employees and we read the Netflix, uh, no rules rules that was written and candor is such an important part of their culture. And it's not 
mean or harsh. It's if you perceive me to be doing something that, that is not in alignment with your expectations, like a wonderful conversation of, hey, Eric, I, when you do this, it, it, it tends to sort of cascade this way. Would you mind not turning over the room while the patient's still in it? Or would you, whatever, whatever it may be. And maybe I'm like, well, I, I, I can reject or accept your, your feedback, but I, I, I would like to hear it. Um, and they had some very wonderful quote, and I'm going to get the numbers wrong, but I'm directionally accurate, like 62% or some some high percentage wanted to hear feedback, but north of 90 felt like constructive feedback was more valuable than positive feedback. That, And it was such an interesting number of, even though we don't want to do it, we believe that it is the makes us a better person to hear constructive feedback. Yeah. So I, I do my own informal sur- survey. I'm like, if you know, if somebody has something that they are feeling about you or thinking about you, would you rather get feedback from them or would you rather them talk to other people about it? And they're like, no, mm. no, I want them to talk to me. I go, okay, well, here we go. Cause this is the beginning. That's right. And, and so, you know, it, it's just that we work uh, as a team, we work our tails off on, you know, all those crucial conversations in all the different ways. And, you know, it's, we, it's a hard hill to climb to get people to be effective at giving feedback. And I won't give up on it, Eric, because I believe it's, it's the thing for long-term relationships is that we have this ability to tell each other hard stuff. And it, and it's just what we open with. It's like, it will make our relationship better if we can navigate through this. No question. And um, so I will, I will uh, die with that flag in my hand. You can do this. You can do this. I think that's so wonderful, Melinda. I, I believe that, that if you own an organization or you are a manager or a leader of people, that candor is probably the most important and the most difficult skill. Yeah. Uh, there's a book. It, it's called Radical Candor. And I forget the author, Kim, yeah. someone, but it's a fascinating book. And she has this chart that breaks down, you know, how, uh, the care versus the the level of of uh, you know truth that you give them, so to speak. And and at the top is the top left. There's a quadrant of it. It's called ruinous empathy, and it's I care a great deal about you, but I don't want to give you feedback. I fear it will hurt your feelings. Mm-hmm. And I think that's just such a good term, ruin of sympathy. I feel like that is such a common trait in our offices of like, yeah. I don't really want to hurt. I don't know how to talk about it. And the problem is if, if you don't express those emotions, eventually you will blow up yeah. on a specific topic. And, and, and then, you know, unfortunately, the reaction will be so, so heavy that all they remember is the reaction, not the message. And I, I think you hit it that if we leaders can do so many positive and negative things, but if they have candor and well-intended candor, yeah. I think that's a, a massive chunk of the leadership skill needed to succeed. Yeah. Like if so you, good for you for, for you pushing get, it. Like if you could get good at one thing, get good at that, right? That that would be the message, right? That would be our message to those doctors because really, yeah. wow, how much of a difference would that make? And the ones that can be honest, it's amazing. Their team would follow them anywhere, you know, Mm -hmm. do anything for them because the doctor had found out, you know, figured out how to be able to have that radical candor on a regular basis. Well, Melinda, this is a great place to end. Thank you so much for your time. I'm I'm so excited to work more together and uh, I will certainly link to your website and, and I'm so excited to have you on the show. Thank you so much. Me too. It is always fun hanging out with you, Eric. You make it so easy to just visit. So thank you. Thank you very much.